Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, Nice to have you here today. You will pick up today's theme pretty quickly, so I'll just give it to you. It's all about grace. Today, our theme as we focus on the pillars of Protestantism is grace. Let's stand together and sing. Our opening song is This is Amazing Grace.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found, was blind. Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. For you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature objects of wrath. But 
because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Join me in the opening prayer. Christ, in this hour of worship, lift us out of the routine of our daily lives and set us up on your holy mount. Let our worship come from our hearts, that it may be genuine. Let our praises for you leap from our mouths, that we may be alive with faith and joy. Make us fresh again.
makes us a smile zone. So um, turn to your neighbor, smile, and greet them this morning as you're seated. and socialize some more uh, during our coffee hour. I also hope if you feel so led, it takes many hands uh, that you might sign up for coffee hour to be a host. Um, what I want to do, I, I, here's my challenge to you. I want to see who can do coffee hour on the lowest budget possible. Now, some people are intimidated by, um, and then some of you are great cooks, uh, don't stop, we love it. But some of you are intimidated by all the fanciness. I really think you can do a $5 coffee hour from the dollar store. Okay? And people will be grateful. Okay? Five candy bars. Five candy bars? No, no. Split them many ways, like pieces of uh, communion bread. Uh, welcome this morning. Uh, nice to have everybody here this morning for worship. Welcome if you're visiting. Nice to have visitors. Welcome if you're back after being away for a while. Uh, welcome everyone. Nice to have you here with us this morning. We've gathered in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as he has asked us to regularly gather, to worship him, to sing his praises, to hear from God's word, and to hopefully walk away feeling encouraged in our faith and ready to go out and serve him all the more. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. Uh, we had some hard workers here this weekend. Uh, many thanks. This is our property resource team, all four of them. We have a couple slots. They painted the downstairs hallway. Uh, John, Dick, Bob, and um, Chuck. How about a hand for them? If these guys can do it, so can you. Uh, they could use a couple more people on property resources if you would like to be a part of keeping this building uh, looking great. Uh, by the way, I have to say this because I just thought to notice it, but many thanks to Bob Crockett who finally fixed that mess right over there that has bugged me forever. And then once he fixed it, I never noticed it. If you don't know what it is, you don't know. But thank you. <laughs> Crop walk is today. Um, who is walking? Wonderful. The rest of you either walk or give. Okay, or you can pray. No. Uh, there's a table downstairs uh, if you'd like. It's fun to walk. Don't worry. Um, uh, honestly, uh, Kathy and I didn't do a great job raising sponsors, so I sponsored her. She's sponsoring me. I know it's pathetic, but it's okay. We're walking anyways because it's a good cause. In fact, speaking of good causes, watch this little video from Church World Services uh, where the money goes. <laughs> I guess that video was entitled to wake you up. Hunger is a big problem, even in the United States. It's amazing to me that anybody in this country of ours would go hungry, but they do. In fact, the food pantries say that um, they are more in demand than ever. 
So part of what will be raised today will go to the Wachusett Food Pantry. Part will go to help people all over the world. So be a part. Uh, it's fun to walk. It's a walk across town with other Christians from other churches. Um, support downstairs. Uh, Wendy will be at her table today. Enough said, Wendy? Yes. Good. Uh, please note our 275th celebration is coming up. And uh, in just a second, I will, I will have the kids come up because I want to talk to them a little bit about it. But uh, parents, we really want you to... Mark, this is as important. It's a great celebration. Uh, we have a new banner that's going to go out front inviting the whole town, saying, come uh, celebrate the town's church, because that's really what this was founded as, even though it's kind of broken off now. And um, we want you to invite your friends and neighbors, if you want, to come on out and celebrate with us at 3 o'clock. There's a banquet to follow. You will need to have tickets. Uh, they're $20 a piece. We will be taking credit cards today. Kurt, I have the machine. I have the thing set up. I'll just have to see. See Kurt, are you at the table? You are now. Um, see Kurt or whoever's at the, at the 275th table, um, and we'll be able to take credit cards if you'd like to buy them today. If you really want to come and the budget is really tight, just let us know. Um, there's enough money to go around in this church. Uh, we will find a way to see that you and your family go. So let us know. Uh, choir practice, practicing today. In the music room right afterwards, bell practice is practicing. I don't think I see Meryl today. But there's a few more ringers needed. Uh, you can ring a bell, like she said last week. Are there anything else for announcements I forgot today? Good. Well, we're glad you're here. Please note the other things going on. Men's Fellowship. Uh, we are in the middle of a wonderful video series on the Reformation. Uh, see the details Wednesday mornings, and we do have a Wednesday night class. We had enough people. You can jump in anytime. And uh, at some point, I'm going to send out a link, uh, hopefully this week, uh, that allows you to catch up online and watch the video too, to those who are just part of the class. So, note those things. Kids, why don't you come forward on your way out to Sunday school. Come up and sit with me for a second. How is everybody? I see pink is a in color, maroon for the boys, blue. You got pink, yep. And some blue. And two dogs. Are they dogs? Nice. Morning everybody, how are you? So how old this is not this is a trick question, but how old do you think this church is? 275? It is 275. You're right. And is that older than you? Is that older than your mom and dad? Is it older than your grandparents? You think so? It is. Yeah, it's a long... Yeah, it is. Because yeah. how old your grandparents live? Maybe 100 years if they're really blessed. A long life, healthy life. Um, but this church is 275 years old. Now, how old is the United States of America? Who's really good with history? To the Republic to which it belongs, right? Um, the United States of America is less than that. Our church was founded in 1742, and there wasn't even a United States of America. So that's how old this church was. America came around in 1776, which is a little later, okay? See that picture up there on the wall? Do you know what that's a picture of? A church. That's a picture of the first meeting house in Holden, which was actually across the street. And it was where Christians first met for worship when, they, when Holden was first established. Um, it burned down. And then this land here was given to us by somebody really famous. Do you know who it was? John Hancock, right? He signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a really famous patriot during the Revolutionary War. And he gave us this land, which we built the town and live, the church, town hall, library on. So, and here's an old picture of our church. Maybe you've seen this. This is going to be on the banner that's going to be out by the street. Um, that's a picture of our church from 1875. And that's still older than anyone who's living. So that's what the church used to look like. See, the front's a little different. There's no steeple on the top. There's no Sunday school wing, which was built in the 1950s. So the church has changed a lot over the years. Guess where that's a picture of? Here. Yeah, that's right here. What's that? Me! What do you think? Yeah, I was.
was around then. I've been here a long time. Um, no, I wasn't around then. Yes, that's a picture. Okay, have you seen that picture before? So what, and what is that that's hanging across the front? Oh, a chain. Yeah, it's like a paper chain, right? And that looks like it's from, the letters are cut off, but you see 1873. I think that's from 1873. That's a long time ago. And they were celebrating an anniversary then, actually, of one of their ministers. But um, we're celebrating an anniversary, and we want to make a chain. Can you guys help us make this? Yes. So look at this. Thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we're going to make a chain like that. You guys are. And... We are going to put the numbers 1742 and 2017 up there and put a chain across the middle. You ready? Right, did it. Will you do it better than me? Yeah. Promise, because I did that wrong. So we're going to do that to celebrate our history. Do you guys think you're making history? Yeah. You are. Even though it doesn't seem like it because you just live in your life today, you're a part of history. And maybe, like... Another 275 years down the road, they'll show a picture of you guys here in church, and they'll be like, look at those people from long ago, before we rode around on hoverboards or something like that, I don't know. Or we transport, I don't know what life's going to be like. Don't you like to think about stuff like that? So, we're going to celebrate, I hope you guys are going to celebrate some of the kids, the chapel singers are going to sing. Um, so if you can be there, uh, that would be great. And Mrs. Hammer will talk to you more about that. And we're going to celebrate because God has blessed this church. It is the oldest church in Holden. It was around before any of the other churches. And that doesn't make us better, but it does make us the oldest. And we're a pretty good church, too. Let's pray. And then I'll send you off to Sunday school. And uh, you guys can make this. Dear God, thank you for this church, and thank you for all the people who have come and gone through this place over the past 275 years. Lord, bless these children who are here today to learn about you and to worship, and are the next generation, that it is our desire to pass the gospel and the church too. Pray that they would be faithful, as we hope to be faithful, and as generations in the past have been faithful. Bless them today as they go to Sunday school. Help them as they grow and learn. Keep them from evil. Help them to grow in grace and truth. In Jesus' name, and all of God's children said really loud, Amen. Amen. All right, off to Sunday school. Who wants to bring this sample? All right, you got it. Oh, bring it. Bring it. You'll fix it. Sunday school. It's kind of nice sitting here, hi guys. It's very comfy. <laughs> Dude, that's the other problem. Shh. now share together our joys and concerns, and I invite you to turn to the back of your bulletin to the prayer box to write things down. Prayer is an important... Yes, Bob. Oh, hold on one second. Are you good? Do you have a prayer concern, right? I'm sorry. Do you have a joy and concern? I, I do. Oh, hold on one second. Um, it's important to write these down and to be praying for one another um, throughout the week. Uh, God answers prayer, and don't underestimate that. God encourages us. The book of James says, we have not because we ask not. And Jesus said, ask for what you need and I will give it to you. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't come the way we want it because sometimes we're looking for an easy way out of everything. That's not God's way, sorry. Uh, but he will see you through and he will work all things for the good. So pray, let's pray for one another. We'll start our joys and concerns with Bob Ferguson. <laughs> as long as we're concentrating on grace, Wonderful. Uh, and she is the daughter of our grandson, Jeff, and his wife, Carrie. She was born in Brunswick, Maine, uh, in September. Wonderful. Um, Emerson, born in Maine. Amelia Grace. Good, that was a test. 
uh, 11th great grandchild for Bob and Nancy. Congratulations. Uh, by the way, a couple people we've been praying for. Jim, it's good to see you back recovering. Uh, Allison, I'm assuming you're doing well. You're here. Yeah, I am. Uh... So again, um, friends of Allison's, Jody uh, gave birth to two babies. Uh, one passed away, and the other was critical, but is stable now and doing better. So we rejoice uh, with Josie, and uh, we continue to pray for Allison and her friends. Other joys and concerns this morning. Oh, Lois, Carol, Clois. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> I just want to um, ask a prayer for my next door neighbor, Mary Ann. Um, she was taken to the emergency room on um, my daughter last week and they diagnosed her with a malignant brain tumor. Um, they removed most of it, but not all. So I pray that um, they'll help me pray her through this because I know the prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective. And we're all righteous in Jesus Christ here. So we're going to have a mighty, mighty prayer for her. Amen. Pray for Mary Ann, um, who has a brain tumor. Uh, Carol's neighbor. My friend. And friend. Dorothy. Glad you're here too. Uh, Dorothy wants to thank God for her many blessings and she's glad to be here today after coming off a bout of pneumonia. Anything else? Lori? Boy, she travels all over the place, doesn't she? Uh, prayers for the Nyman's daughter, Kristen. Uh, she travels to South Korea. Kelly? Kelly and Jeff's, uh, Greg, sorry, Greg, I had Greg. Greg and Kelly's son, uh, just graduated from the police academy, um, and pray for him as he enters into this line of work, which has become so contentious. I don't know who would want to be a police officer these days, but God bless people like Trevor and others who uh, go into this, because we need it. Uh, and let's pray for all of our emergency workers um, in the environment. And let's pray, too, that, that the issues that are real... Um, and that need to be addressed, really get addressed. Because there is some corruption. I don't want to make a political thing here, but we need to pray for that too. Obviously, there's some problems, and let's pray for the entire policing network. Uh, the good cops uh, do the right thing, and the ones that aren't doing the right things um, learn better ways. Anything else? Russ? She's stuck where? She's stuck in Puerto Rico. Oh, Puerto Rico. Oh, boy. She's, she's had some flights that have been canceled. They've been back, so she continues to teach her son. Okay. Uh, one of Paul's, at first when you say one of my sons, I'm like, do you have more than one, Paul? <laughs> one of his, Paul's uh, preschool teachers or caregivers is uh, stuck in Puerto Rico. So pray for her. Let's pray for all the people in Puerto Rico. Was that a hand, Jennifer? Yes. Just a joy. Todd and I celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary yesterday. Wonderful. Happy anniversary, Todd and Jennifer. <laughs> did you get her something nice, Todd? <laughs> did, you, yeah. did you remember? <laughs> Today is all about grace. <laughs> No, wait a minute, Chris. My parents were here and it was just confirmed that he does have saint, saint status oh. because he lives with me. 
I remember that. Okay. 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 Yes, it is about God's grace, but spouses have to give grace too. That's what we're. Chris, I'm glad you're here. That's what we're going to learn in the sermon later. Just pay attention. I saw that on email. Let's come before our God and let's pray. Oh, good and gracious God, today we are very mindful of your grace, your undeserved mercy and kindness towards us. Thank you, Lord, for every good thing. Lord, it is by your grace and your gift to us that we come before you each day and that we gather weekly to worship you. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. As we've already begun to pray and worship, hear these additional prayers that we bring before your throne. We pray for those who've been mentioned, we pray for um, and rejoice with the birth of Amelia Grace and ask your blessing upon her, Lord, as um, she enters into life. We pray for baby Josie, Lord, and, and while we mourn the passing, of her sibling, we pray for her continued health and thank you that she's doing better and be with her parents and those who care about the family. We pray for Mary Ann and the brain tumor that she has, Lord, and pray that by your grace you might heal her if it be your will. Thank you that she has good friends um, and others who care for her and lift her up in prayer. We thank you that Jim is able to return with us and continue to bless him in his recovery. We thank you that Dorothy is back with us and we ask you to bless her and as she lifts before you, Lord, her many blessings and she's right. Lord, we have been blessed so abundantly, all of us, and while we count our wounds and our sorrows, may we also remember all of the many blessings and be grateful for all you've given to us. We pray for Kristen as she travels to South Korea and watch over all who travel. Thank you for the great gift of travel. We pray for Trevor as he enters into uh, police service. Lord, be with our police. And thank you that they are there to keep us safe. Thank you for all who uh, do good and do well. And Lord, for those areas where there's contention and abuse of power, uh, we pray for justice, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to get this right. Uh, for we do not want to see our police abuse people, but we also want to see our police honored for so many do such good things, Lord. Bless our police, bless our fire, bless our emergency medical personnel. Lord, thank you for those public servants who are there in times of crisis and need to keep us safe and to help us. Continue to raise up good people, Lord, who would be willing to take on that life of service in today's day and age. We pray for the people of Puerto Rico and as Russ has mentioned Paul's teacher and all of those, Lord, who are trapped there, who still want to get back to the mainland. And for those, Lord, who live there and are even more trapped without water and without um, houses and electricity, Lord, we pray for that crisis and we lift that little island to you, Lord, and pray that you would pour out your blessing, that you would open the floodgates from the wealth and the ingenuity of the United States and even other countries to be able to help Puerto Rico rebuild and get back on its feet. And Lord, in that same vein, we pray for the people of Florida and the people of Texas and the Panhandle. We pray for those who have lost homes and entire neighborhoods and towns in the wildfires out in California. Lord, the earth seems to be raging lately, Lord. And we pray that you would be with the people who are devastated by these things. And help us to pull together, Lord, to rebuild. But Lord, give these people hope. For what do you have when you lose everything? We have you, Lord. Thank you for the hope that we have that should the entire bottom of life fall out, we have you. And we have eternal life in you. Lord, may that hope continue to spread. And may it be the thing that people grab onto in the middle of crisis. May this church, Lord, continue to be a place where the gospel is proclaimed and where Jesus Christ, our firm foundation, is continually established and built upon. And Lord, where people continue to come to know you. And Lord, may the gospel go out through the streets and the byways, the cities, the internet, everywhere around the world, Lord, that people may hear of your love and of your salvation. And find a hope that is truly hope that they can hold on to. In good times when you, your blessings are pouring down. And in tough times when life is falling completely apart. 
You are our God. You are our Savior. Hear our prayer. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen.
choir. I love that song. You did a nice job. Let's continue to worship our God by hearing from his word. <clears throat> I will be reading our first two, and Greg will be reading from the Gospel of John. Our theme, obviously, is grace. So turn to Romans chapter 5. Uh, it's on page 1750 and 51, your pew Bibles. So I'm actually going to read the first two verses of chapter 5, and then the last two verses of chapter 5 and the first two of verse 6. In a sense, um, I'm going to read you the introduction and the conclusion and skip the meat in the middle um, just for clarity. So Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since through faith we have peace with God, through our Lord, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Flipping over to verse 20. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Here ends our first reading. Flip over to the short little book of Titus. Chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Here ends our second reading. Our third reading is from the Gospel of John. And we're talking about chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, so that can be found on page 1662 of your few Bible. So John 8, starting with verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were asking this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this point, those who heard began to go away one at a time the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the women still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
the gospel of the Lord. It's over. It's over. The verdict has been handed down. The jury has met and deliberated. They've made a decision, and you've received it. Guilty, and this is it. No more appeals, it's over. Guilty. The penalty won't be life, it'll be death. The penalty is death for what you did. There's no more appeals. That's over. Doesn't matter, I guess, anyways, because it's not like you're an innocent victim who's framed for a crime you didn't commit or who is simply misunderstood you did it. And you know you did it. And you got caught. And you've been tried. And you've been found guilty. And you've been sentenced to death. And it's over. There's nothing more you can do. It's a terrible feeling, isn't it? None of you here have felt that because you wouldn't be here. But maybe you felt trapped like that. There's nothing humanly possible that you can do. But then enters grace. God's amazing grace. If I hit the right button, it's that simple. Grace. If someone came up to you guilty as charged, and you did it, you're, you're guilty as you know what. You did it. And you're caught. Think of some of the people you, you see who commit crimes. And you say, I hope they get what they deserve, because you know they did it. And they get what they deserve, and you're like, serves them right. So you're one of those people. You're caught that bad, serves you right, guilty, sentenced, yeah, I hope you burn in hell. People say that. I know you say that. And someone comes along and says, I'm going to give you grace. You don't deserve it. You're guilty. You deserve your sentence. You deserve jail. You deserve to burn in hell. But I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to let you off. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to remove the judgment from you. I'm going to set you free. My friends, that's grace. That is is grace. When there, you are so stuck in darkness, in sin, in whatever, that you can't get yourself out. And you don't deserve to get out. But someone who loves you comes and rescues you anyways, in spite of yourself. That's grace. We're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation and the 275th anniversary of this church, as most of you know. 500 years ago, Martin Luther is sort of given the birth date and the fame of nailing those 95 theses to the door. By the way, I got a copy of the 95 theses from the Lutheran church. I'm going to nail them to our door over the next couple weeks. I just thought it would be fun. They said, you're really going to do that? I said, I will. So, don't rip them down. <laughs> and we learned the five core principles from the Protestant Reformation. We've been going through them this month. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gracia, Sola Fide, Sola Christus, Sola De Gloria. They're all Latin. By Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. 
We've already gone through the first two and established that from the Reformation, and we are a child of the Reformation, this church and the whole movement that we're a part of, it is Scripture that will be our authority and the way we will test every thought and every idea of what God is about and what He desires us to be about. It is by faith, that, as we talked about last week, that we are saved and not of ourselves. By grace, we are saved. I know we did that a little backwards, but it worked better that way. By grace, we are saved through faith in Christ for the glory of God alone. And we learn that from Scripture. So today we're going to focus on sola gracias, grace. But first, let's start with the bad news. Spiritually speaking before God... And we have to understand this. I always tell people, the Christian faith and the good news of the gospel makes no sense unless you realize how bad it really is. Unless you realize the sentence that has been handed down on you. Because it's bad. And you're stuck. There is no way out of it. Start with Ephesians 2, that's one of our passages. I put it as a call to worship, so it's in your bulletin if you want to refer to it. But as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. The sin that we're born with in this world that we're born into creates in us death. Because life is found in God, who's the bread of life, the water of life, the fountain of life, and we're born into a world that is separated from Him. And so while we think we have life, and we do have a little bit of something that seems okay, but we don't really have the life. We're dead. We're in the darkness. We're hidden from God. John Calvin, who's one of the other great reformers, this is a word we don't talk about a lot in today's church, but we need to. Total depravity. It's depressing, huh? So you're totally depraved. I'm totally depraved. We are helpless. We are stuck. We can't stop sinning. We should. We feel guilty. We feel bad about it, and then we go right back out and we do it again. We're enslaved to sin, and it's killing us, and we are dead in it. We are totally depraved. And like that person who has that death sentence and no more appeals and there's no hope, what can save us from our sins and this total depravity in human nature that has no hope of ever getting it right with God? Grace. So little snippets from that wonderful passage which I think is foundational for faith by faith in grace of Christ. Saved by grace through faith in Christ. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Why did God, notice the motivation there, why did God do this for us? Because we're such great people? Because he looks down and says, oh, they're not that bad. No, because of his great love. My friends, rest in that for a minute. You are loved by God. He knows who you are. And he doesn't need to be impressed by who you are because he's not. Don't take that bad. Just... Deep breath, take the pressure off. He just loves you. God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. And if I was to do the rest of that verse, I said, even when you were dead. See, you were so dead in your sin, you couldn't even find your way out. And God came to you. God comes to us and gives us mercy and grace. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So last week we talked about how you embrace this grace. It's by faith. You simply need to believe because there's really nothing else you can do. There's nothing else you can do because you're helpless. But believe in the grace that God has given you. You see that? So it's his gift to you. It's a gift. You do not earn your standing with God. This God who's holy and righteous and full of life and light and who we're born into a world disconnected from Him, to bridge that gap is not something you can do with all your efforts and striving, no matter how many books or podcasts or sermons you listen to or how many times you read through the Bible. You can't do it on your own. 
God comes to you with grace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God gives it to us anyways because he loves us. And that's what salvation is. Simple as that. Not saved, separated from God. Saved back in relationship with God. Look at a couple of these other verses. Oh, this is, this is our covenant. This is the kind of thinking that our church was born into. If you pick up Jane Neal's history book or see the church covenant, this is how it begins. We whose names are hereunto subscribed, inhabitants of hold, and that's how it begins, dot, 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 do confess ourselves unworthy to be so highly favored of the Lord and admire His free and rich grace which calls us hereunto. There it is right there. Do confess ourselves unworthy to be so highly favored of our God. You see, our forebearers who lived before us, they didn't live in this self-esteem culture that we live. where We're having a hard time admitting our problems because we feel like we always have to be up and, and telling ourselves almost lies about ourselves. But they knew it was okay. Why? Because you can admit how low you are, how depraved you are, because God's love goes that low. Do confess our unworthy Lord of such height. We're not worthy of it. You committed that crime. The people are right. You deserve judgment. But God has stooped to your level and given you grace. This is foundational to what we believe. I'm going to move forward. We're running out of time here. <clears throat> so now you've received grace. Isn't that great? You can't earn salvation. You can't earn a right relationship with God. So now you have received this amazing grace. How does it make you feel? Do you feel good? If you don't, try to live into that grace and, and get it into your heart and your mind so you can sing like we sang that this morning. My chains are gone. I've been set free from whatever's holding you back. Sin is like a slave. Guilt is like a slave. There's no condemnation for you. For you are set free in Christ. Now, this can bring to an illogical conclusion. I remember struggling with this when I was in college. And I went to a party school, Zoo Mass. I wasn't a wild partier, but I enjoyed my weekends. And I remember when I first came to Christ thinking, now wait a minute. If I can just be forgiven by God's grace of everything, why not just go out and kind of live it up and enjoy myself? And on Monday morning, I'll just ask for forgiveness and Christ will be faithful and forgive me. And on I'll go. That really bothered me because I thought, I really understand this grace. I cannot earn my salvation. God has given me a wonderful gift of forgiving every single one of my sins. So why not just live sinfully? Because God gets the glory. Hey, the bigger sinner I am, the more he forgives. How great is God, you know? I mean, if God forgives me for saying a, a mean word to him, that's okay. But if God forgives me for being a terrorist, that's even huge. And wow, God's amazing. So if I sin more, right? Chris, you're tracking with me here, huh? Let's go crazy, right? What should we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? What does it say, Chris? Shut up. What's it say? Where were you? I lost In the middle. <laughs> All right, by no means. By no means. You got it? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? So here's the thing. Get this. God's grace is so wonderful in His gift to us. Not only does He forgive us of our sins, but He sets us free. Those things that we think are so pleasurable, back in my UMass days, I'm like, isn't that silly? Like, all those decadent things, young people, you think it's life, partying, and all this stuff you do, and then you realize, it's not really life, it's just kind of wild living. And, and, and God says, I'm going to set you free from that. I'm going to set you free from feeling you need all that stuff, to fulfill your life because it really just leads to blah, leads to death. And I'm going to change your heart and transform you and set you free from those desires so that you desire good things. 
You desire to live right and be responsible. You desire to do good to other people. And your heart is changed full of love. So you're not out there trying to indulge yourself, right? Like our, our next verse said. Got that, Chris? By no means. For the grace of God has appeared. It offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say what? No. To say what? No. That felt good. No to ungodliness and worldly passions. This grace comes to us and it says, you know what? I've forgiven you and now I'm giving you strength. Say no to it. Not because you have to, because you feel guilty. That's not the motivation. Because your heart's being changed and you love other things. I don't want to waste my time indulging myself in pleasure when I can be living for the will of God because I love God. He set me free. He cut me a huge break. And I want to do what's good and right because I want to because my heart's changing. This is what God's grace does. Teach us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Two illustrations to wrap up my message this morning. I was reading this week... Max Lucado wrote a book on grace. Max Lucado is a good writer. If you're looking for something to read, pick up one of his books. But he was talking about this story, and the chapter on this story, he called it The God Who Stoops. And here's Jesus in this story, stooping down to meet the gaze of this sinful woman. She's not a victim, she's not misunderstood, she's a homewrecker. She's committing adultery. I don't know whether she was a prostitute or what. But she was clearly doing what was wrong. It was reprehensible. She deserves what she gets. But Jesus cuts her a break. And he stoops to her level. And her, you know the story. Her accusers want to stone her. But Jesus said, well, those of you who are without sin, throw the first stone. At least those Pharisees had enough softness of heart, though it was pretty hard to recognize they had sin and they walked away. Jesus steeps to her level. She knows she's guilty. She deserves it. She got caught. And he says, I don't condemn you. I forgive you. Notice the second thing he says. That's redeeming part of grace. Now go and leave your life of sin. That's grace. You know, this great hymn that we're going to sing again in a minute with the regular cadence that you know better, though I love that version by Chris Tomlin. It was written by John Newton. Do you know the story a little bit? There's a movie made called Amazing Grace. Check it out, I think you can get it streaming too. Watch it this afternoon if you're bored. Of the story of John Newton, he was a ship captain and he was a slave trader. And he came to Christ and he felt so guilty that he was capturing people from Africa and bringing them over to the United States and making them slaves. And, and I, I can only picture that in history. I can't imagine what it would be like to experience firsthand that dynamic. And he felt so guilty for what he'd done. And he said, how can God ever forgive a man like me? And then he penned these words. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Again, in our modern self-esteem type world, a lot of churches change that and say, like, it saved and set me free or something like that. But no, we need to get that Calvinistic total depravity. We've got a problem theology in there. He saved a wretch like me. I don't deserve it, God. You don't owe me anything. You owe me death. You owe me judgment. You owe me hell. But because of your great love and your amazing grace, I love to hear about it, you've saved a wretch like me, like you. This is grace. This is the gift of God held out to you. All he asks is you receive it by faith and go forward from there. He's got a great plan for you. It's all in His grace. And it's all a work that He's going to do and not a work that you can do yourself. So relax. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Find peace in Him. Receive His grace. And as it transforms you, 
you will do the good things that you've been trying forever to do. And you will be the people that God has called you to be. Let's sing this song together. We'll sing it a cappella. <coughs> Amazing grace, how sweet. much for your abundantly generous gift to us, what can we say? Receive these, our offerings, that we offer as a token response for all that you've blessed us with, Lord. And use them to strengthen the ministry of your church in this place, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ 
across the street and to the ends of the earth and to help people in need along the way. Till you come again in all your glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, it's actually in our hymnal, but it's on an insert because it's written a little better. This seemed like the perfect hymn to sing today because it's kind of a fun little ditty. Um, Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Because I felt as we end, sometimes when we talk about how far we've fallen and sinned and how great God's grace, it's very sobering and it should be, but God's grace is so complete that we can just read. Rejoice and even be silly and sing of his grace. So let us sing with confidence and with joy the wonderful grace of Jesus to conclude our service.
you and he has given you amazing grace. Bathe yourself in it. Enjoy it. Let it transform you. Go forth filled with his grace. Go forth and be the people by grace he's called you to be. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.